Hi everyone, sorry I couldn't be in class today, but I'm recording remotely as a top biosecurity official with the Department of Health and Human Services Chemical and Biological Defense Division. And I'm here to advocate against the publication of the nanoshell research on the grounds that it would substantially increase the risk of bioterrorism while only providing marginal health benefits. If it did need to be published, I would advocate that the research only be published on the condition that the information that would be instrumental in the construction of the nanoshells be removed from general publication and made accessible only to selected individuals on a need-to-know basis. On the next slide is a roadmap of what I'm going to talk about. First, I'll discuss the NSA BB framework, then the risk from bioterrorism, then the risk from publishing nanoshell research, then the potential public health gains from publishing the research, then the importance of scientific openness, and finally, I'll provide a final recommendation. On the next slide is the, my discussion of the NSABB framework for the oversight of dual-use life sciences research. The key question that this framework poses is, does the potential risk of publishing the research outweigh the benefits, um, outweigh the benefits of publishing it? And that means that we are only looking at the risk versus reward in this particular case. This framework asks a couple of questions. First, are there reasonably anticipated risks to public health and safety from direct misapplication of the information? I would say yes. Second, is it reasonably anticipated that the information can be directly misused to pose a threat? Again, yes. Third, in what time frame might this information be used to pose a threat? I would say potentially in the near future. On the next slide, I'm going to discuss the risk from a bioterrorism attack. First, the potential impact of a bioterrorism attack could be catastrophic. It would have terrible effects on public health. It could damage the food supply or the water supply. It could have devastating impacts on critical infrastructure, which would cause billions of dollars in economic damage. And finally, it could have an immense psychological effect by creating a culture of fear uh, around, the potential around potential death from a silent, invisible killer. If a pathogen were engineered correctly, then it could even cause mass casualties up in the millions or even the billions with a small risk of wiping out the human race. So the presumption in this case should be towards caution because the potential risk from a bioterrorist attack is so, so high. Bioweapons are the easiest WMD for terrorists to acquire because they're cheap. The weapons and the weapons are generally available as opposed to a nuclear weapon, which is very difficult to find and construct. Bioweapons are also relatively easy to transport because they're small and could just look like medicine. Additionally, a bioweapon is self-sustaining, which means that it can literally replicate itself inside human cells, which means that it requires relatively less in order to create a massive impact. Finally, advances in biotechnology and the dual-use nature of much of this technology ensures potential easy access to a pathogen and the increased uh, virulence of new diseases that are developed. Additionally, we are unprepared for an attack. A computer simulation done by Boston University showed that a bioweapon could spread easily from an urban area internationally before detection as a result of globalization linking the world together and people traveling all the time, which would mean, which would obviate the effects of public health because it would not be able, these responses would not be able to respond fast enough before it spread. Additionally, it is unlikely that, that the public health system would be able to create vaccines fast enough to stem the flow of a brand new weapon because it is relatively difficult to create, a disease, to create a vaccine, especially relative to the speed with which some diseases can spread. On the next side, I'm going to talk about why the publication of this nanoshell research is particularly dangerous. The delivery of a bioweapon is the largest hurdle. The end is the largest hurdle for a bioterrorist attack. For a bioterrorist, the anthrax letters in the Om Shinrikyo attack show that it is possible to acquire a dangerous pathogen, and biotech advances more recently, as well as information dissemination across the internet, mean that it is even easier to acquire that information. Avenging Israel's blood, the Rajneeshis and Amshin Rikyo, which were the three most successful chemical and biological attacks of all time, were most limited because of the crudity of their delivery system. Additionally, it is unlikely that a delivery via aerosols would work because it would require too large of an area to disperse, and it would require a relatively large amount of pathogens to infect many people, especially because many diseases cannot survive in the open air. However, publication of the formula for the Gates nanoshell would allow the delivery of a bioweapon via the gastrointestinal tract in food or liquid because the nanoshells do not dissolve upon making, uh, only dissolve upon making contact with the stomach contents. The nanoshells would therefore ensure more accurate and efficient delivery by protecting the pathogen from the environment, the sanitation system, and the body's immune system, which would mean that there would be a substantially increased risk of a successful attack. 
On the next slide, I'll discuss the public health benefits of publishing the nanoshell research, and I conclude that they are relatively small, especially when compared to the risk of a bioterror attack. The nanoshells are useful for transporting vaccines to the remote parts of the world, but they're remote parts of the world, so there are relatively few people living in these areas, and it is possible to employ refrigeration techniques to provide at least some of the vaccines to obviate most of the benefit from providing these new vaccines. It is unwise, in my opinion, to jeopardize potentially the health of every single person on the planet because we are unwilling to spend a little more to refrigerate vaccines and because tribal leaders in Africa are scared of needles. My conclusion is that the risk of a bioterror attack pale is that the risk of a bioterror attack massively outweighs the potential benefit from publication of this research. Finally, the discussion of scientific openness is often brought up when uh, fears of censoring scientific discoveries are brought about. However, this case is not the linchpin of scientific openness. The framework that I discuss above means that it is possible to maintain the scientific ethos of openness while still, while still preventing the publication of some scientific advances that are so dangerous, and the risk of a the massively increased a risk of a bioterror attack means that this is one of the few instances that should not be published. The risk is too large in this instance, so it is not worth sacrificing innocent lives on the altar of scientific purity. Finally, on the next slide, I have a final recommendation, and that is that, that this research not be published because the risk that it increases a bioterror attack is too large, and that, pro that definitively outweighs the benefit, the public health benefits that publication would provide. If it must be published, then the information necessary for the construction of nanoshells should be removed from general publication and made accessible only to selected individuals on a need-to-know basis so as to minimize the risk of a bioterror attack and maximize the potential benefit of scientific advances.